This is State of the Surveillance podcast number one, with Pippa King, Katrina Day, Steve Jolly, Nathan Allenby and Steve Hernandez. Pippa King starts the podcast off. I started in 2005, my kids were six and seven, and I was on the school PTA, and I spotted in the library a thumbprint scanner um, for our library, library card system scheme. And my kids were six and seven, and the school only had 160 kids in it. You know, library security didn't need that level of security for a library book in a primary school. And so I asked the head teacher, when are you going to ask my permission? And she just said, I don't need your permission. And she was right. And so... I, just from that point onwards, I thought, this is wrong. The law needs changing. And that was my goal. And that was, yeah, I wasn't going to stop until that happened. And if it never happened, then I would still keep campaigning for it. I would still be doing it now. But um, so to cut a long story short, I met up with other parents and worked for privacy organisations uh, that were based in London. And we lobbied MPs uh, through 2007 to 2010. And then there was general election. They had a change of government. We had a, a Conservative Lib Dem coalition. And they were good and true to their word. That's why we lobbied them in opposition. They said they would bring uh, legislation in that would deal with this. Personally, I would have liked to have seen it banned. But they didn't. They just regulated it so that uh, children under 18, parents have to give consent for this. Um, and through the course of campaigning against biometrics in schools, I looked across the states, thought, bet they're doing it in the states. And, of course, they weren't, actually. There was a very limited... What, but what they were doing in the states was RFID chipping the kids. or not chipping the kids, but making them carry. Now, Steve, I don't know if you remember, there was that case in uh, California, wasn't there? I was in touch with the parent over there when they first started doing it, and then there was a huge outcry. And so I was in touch with... Her, I think she was called Marie Tatro, and we communicated. So I was talking, telling her about the biometrics. She was telling me about the RFID... And um, I, so I was aware of the RFID right from sort of 2006. So I was always keeping an eye out to see if that was happening in the UK. So, of course, when the legislation was passed in 2012, the Protection of Freedoms Bill, which had the three clauses in about fingerprinting kids and they're not allowed to do it unless both parents got well, one parent consents and nobody disconsents. Um, I thought, oh, I, do you know what? I, I, I can have a rest now. And this is exactly, uh, Steve, when your, your story hit in the summer of 2012. And the Protection and Freedoms Bill got passed in May 2012. And it was over the course of that summer I was following your story with Andreas. And I sort of had a light bulb moment. And I was washing up one day in late August that, that, that summer. And I thought, do you know what? It was never about biometrics. Because biometrics are good. But all they do is tell you where one person is at one point in time. But RFID, that tells you where everybody is at every point in time. And I suddenly thought, you know, if you wanted to uh, slip something under the radar, what you would do, you would do something awful to primary school children, which would be to fingerprint them for a library card system. And then you'd get a parent like myself that's really annoyed. And uh, I'd go through Parliament and, you know, oh, we'd do the right thing and we'd pass a, pass a law and look, aren't we democratic? Isn't that great? And all the time underneath that, they're going to slip in something else, something that's invisible. Yeah, something that's invisible. And that's exactly what they did in 2010 in a college in West Cheshire. And um, it wasn't until I started looking at the RFID that, obviously, Andrea and Steve had highlighted in the States. I just thought, you know, I've got a bit of spare time now, got the bill passed, I wonder if that's happening in the UK. And, fair, and sure enough, it was. And just one college, one college were doing it, but they tagged 5,500 kids with a military uh, grade RFID, which was at 6.35675 gigahertz, that was emitting every second. Here. Yeah. It was, it's this big. Um, when somebody else is speaking, I'll, I'll run and get it. I've actually got one in my, in my kitchen drawer. One of the parents <laughs> sent one. But they were, they were carrying this. And, and, of course, this was going 24-7, uh, emitting every second for a 100-metre radius, which is over 300 feet. So there were 5,500 of these tags around West Cheshire. And um, oh, Nathan, can you turn your volume down a bit? Sorry, because I, I can hear myself coming through, and it's coming through, and you're flashing, so I'm obviously... So they had 5,500 of these tags uh, in and around West Cheshire. Um, and because the standard that the children were wearing was unstandardised, it was military-grade, and it was, they were still developing it, 
uh, when it was eventually developed in, I think it was May 2012, and this was the article that I'd picked up on in the August when I had the light bulb moment after Steve and Andrea's um, uh, adventures over in San Antonio. Um, the RFID Journal had published an article saying the, the IEEE, which is the Institute of Ele Electric and Electronical Engineers, had approved this standard um, that these school kids have been wearing. And isn't it great? And we can do X, Y, and Z. And interest is great like that. They like to blow their own trumpet. So they gave the details of the manufacturer, the standard of the RFID, and the, the, and the fact that kids have been wearing it since 2010. And, but I, so I scoured the internet, and there was nothing else on it at all. There was nothing on the college website. There was nothing on Zebra Technologies' website. It wasn't until the standard had been approved that the whole industry went, brilliant, the standard's approved. They got to the, uh, one of the um, uh, sort of buildings managers from the college, flew him over to Florida to talk at an international conference in RFID about the return on investment this, this had been given, this RFID had been for the kids. And so I just started my Against RFID in Schools blog and started writing about Steve's case, West Cheshire College. And uh, I had a the whole FOI, Freedom of Information thing with the college, just turned into a dog's dinner. In the end, they didn't want to answer any questions, but I got the Information Commissioner's office involved. And uh, eventually, very conveniently, they closed the RFID down after a five and a half month trial. Even though they've been using it since 2010, uh, they'd only officially been testing it since uh, I think it's September 2012, and they shut it down January 2013. And then the principal left, got a golden handshake, and an OBE. So, 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 so uh, but they did shut it down, but not without a big hoo-ha and an article in the Guardian, which Wendy Grossman wrote, which was great, sort of highlighting. So, I mean, my main aim now is, is to really keep a, a lid on how schools operate this technology. Um, we've made it more difficult for the industry to supply RFID to the schools. And if I find any other schools in the UK that think it's a good idea to tag kids, well, <laughs> they better have a good argument why they think well, we it is. We need to find out from, from parents uh, what, what they have. And because, as you said, this... Um, school uh, didn't actually advertise that it was doing it. It wasn't uh, out in the open until the magazine said um, and who ha about it. So what we need to do is uh, proactively ask questions. That's exactly what school. it did. What I the thing is, what way. happened was the school hadn't told the parents, they hadn't fully informed the kids. They were also carrying other bits of plastic around the neck, so it was hidden within this sort of lanyard that they were carrying. <coughs> the local paper was really interested until we got to the point where we nearly got an article in the local paper and then that particular journalist wouldn't speak to me. And he'd been nobbled, I think, by the principal and the councillors um, above him. I was, I'd been in touch with a parent who's, who actually, bizarrely, had actually rung me about his younger son at a high school uh, that they were fingerprinting at. And he mentioned that his older son was going to West Cheshire College. And I just said, has he got a tag around his neck? And he said, yeah. I said, Tell him to take it off because it's, it's emitting RFID every second. Um, so and that, so that's how I ended up getting a copy of the chip. But so that's that's how I've got from where I was in 2005 to where we are now in 2015. So that's my sort of background, just to raise awareness of this <coughs> technology and just to halt it. Basically, it's not the way a healthy society, I think, works. You know, we're, we're relying on technology rather than human instincts to to find our way through life. And that's that's not how we should be. I, you know, I want to be private. I don't want to have to be facially recognised every time I go into a shopping centre or, or have my eyes tracked when I'm looking at whatever product's on a shelf without knowing about it. And I just... I, and so that's, all these custom algorithms also, it probably or most likely could do the entrapment. In other words, set up the algorithms by which the person is pushed into doing something, whether it's a crime or whether it's a, it's buying something. Or if, if you may not want to purchase the product, but it can be pushed. Or you may be um, not quite there, uh, but introduce some kind of violence in your feelings and agitation, and you end up doing something that you would never so Kat, do. So, seeing as you're, you're sort of, you know, I mentioned Stephen, if, this, if I can edit bits out, so if we're going to do this podcast, do you want to um, say that where, sort of where you've come from and how I, you know? Absolutely. Well, okay, very briefly, um, I had um, two lovely dogs um, 
they died now at 16 and 15 and a half. And 12 years ago, I was um, a vet recommended um, to have um, them chipped. Uh, I wasn't given enough information about it, and I wasn't very clued up about the Big Brother in those days. But just the idea of putting an implant in their body, you know, they were just my, like my babies. You know, I loved them. And all of a sudden, this vet is telling me, put an implant in them. And um, I, I, it made me feel very uncomfortable. So I refused. Um, uh, later on, um, I um, watched that many people were doing it, and um, I've observed the pattern of change of mentality because it's an animal. Let nobody um, say that I'm comparing children to dogs or humans to animals, but there was some kind of change or diversion of mentality because these days, now we've got this law that e every dog uh, has to be chipped by 2016, otherwise you will be paying £500 fine, you'll be breaking the law. But people have done it, and if you tell them that it's bad for a dog, they will feel uncomfortable and angry with you because because they love their animals and they've accepted the status quo, they think that you are telling them that you, um, they're mistreating their dogs, that they don't love their dogs or they don't love their animals so they will feel upset because you are upsetting them destroying the comfort they feel with the authority and with surrounding environment this is the problem that if ever um, that comes about in humans and if they start chipping their children when you tell them that they don't love their children or oh, they, they shouldn't have microchipped their child, they would think that you're giving them, you're telling them that they don't love their children anymore. This is because they've already become part of it. And this is the danger that I can see there, because I thought by 2016, I would be breaking the law. I'm against it. And if I don't do anything about it, one day and very soon, this will happen to us, to people. Because... What I've, I mean, I've um, worked 10 years uh, training people on Microsoft packages and databases. I've got a BSc in computing and I have worked in input output computers. In other words, I've sold the contract of virtualization, which means that if you virtualize your office machines, they've got no memory. Their memory is taken by another support machine elsewhere or in the cloud, like Internet based machine and all the operations come from there and your computers become a copycat of their own self. And now with the technology it is possible that if you allow this microchip inside your system, in your body, you become copycat a copycat of yourself. You don't really know where the information is coming from and what you're doing is what is your what your mind is. It, it's not yours anymore because you've actually handed over the management of your mind to something else. And this is such a scary prospect that I think there are lots of issues that I believe in, but I haven't really um, done much about it. I kept myself neutral, but this is one particular issue that I cannot um, stand neutral and watch it happen because if I do not raise the awareness help people who do that and do my own bit in society we are all in trouble because everybody is is facing that because this is a business they treat it as business it's a corporate thing and they've got technological capacity to do that they do surveillance. They Every single person is a number. Every single person can be profiled. And everything from what he is and what he does and where he goes and what he can possibly do in future is all catalogued and put it on a da database, which means that we are not private anymore without our consent. But if this is imposed on us, I mean a microchip, on us, legally that we've got no right to refuse because if you want a passport you have to have it inside your body or on your body as a tattoo then you know you've got no rights without that and we have to fight this because that will be the ultimate that we will be facing here so that is the reason what got me into um uh, uh into this activism um i think i've got um the same problem that Julie is worried about, but when I talk about it, I get a bit more emotional. <laughs> because that's it does. great, Kat. Thanks. So. No, that's really good. Um, I think that really naturally goes into Steve Hernandez, and then we'll do Steve Jolly because you've not said anything yet. <laughs> Sorry. So, I, I was going to say we should go to Steve Jolly. Okay. Steve said well, let's do let's do Mr. Jolly then. 
Okay, my name's Steve Jolly. Um, I got involved in activism and campaigning against surveillance, uh, specifically camera surveillance. In April 2010, it all started when something happened in my neighbourhood. Hundreds of cameras just popped up almost overnight on posts by the side of the road. And nobody knew who'd put them there or what they were for. So a few people started asking questions, saying, well, what are all these cameras about? And nobody seemed to know. The local councillor didn't know. Local police didn't know. They said it's nothing to do with them. And so it was a bit of a mystery. And then uh, my local councillor found out that um, there was an organisation called Safe for Birmingham Partnership and that they were responsible for putting up 216 cameras in uh, a couple of neighbourhoods in Birmingham. So it wasn't across the whole city, it was just in specific locations, two areas. And they just said, uh, oh, it's about community safety and um, crime reduction, you know, stopping uh, local crime and uh, vehicle crime and so on. Um, but it emerged that they'd got funding uh, well, I say it emerged, I managed to find out some documentary evidence of uh, who paid for the scheme. Three and a half million pounds had come from the Association of Chief Police Officers Terrorism Fund. So when the local police claimed it was just about l local community safety, uh, clearly it wasn't because it was the money came from the Home Office to ACPO um, uh, for terrorism purposes, uh, counter-terrorism. And uh, it was very odd. Um, so that's what got me started. I challenged it because I thought, well, this is a blanket surveillance scheme. And what it was was mainly automatic number plate recognition cameras that were put in a ring of steel, is, is the phrase. So encircling an area so you can't drive in or out without having your papers checked, your vehicle and driver details run through a database and effectively investigated so I thought this was unjust, uh, not just because it targeted Muslim communities, but because it was a blanket thing that affected anyone who, who, who lived or worked or visited those areas. And because it was hugely controversial, it became a massive media story. Uh, I went to the press, I went to The Guardian and sort of raised the alarm and made sure that the story stayed in the media. And it caused so much negative PR for... Uh, West Midlands Police that eventually after eight months that the only way they could kill the story was to kill the scheme and they just agreed to take the cameras down and apologize and said sorry we made a mistake there you know let's just uh, forget about it and move on so that's what got me started and that was a massive success it's the first time I've ever heard of cameras being taken down normally we just hear about them going up so that obviously spurred me on and made me realize that individuals can have an effect you, you can challenge something and win uh, immediately after that my local councillor wanted to put cctv cameras up on the high street in mosley where i live um, simply because he thought it would be an enhancement to the area that it was just a good thing you know there was no specific reason the police did weren't asking for it nobody was asking for it apart from this one councillor who thought that it would be a popular idea but obviously it came up against some opposition in the form of me and other people locally who agreed with me. And we forced him to have a, a public meeting and uh, a, a sort of um, consultation. And um, we managed to defeat that as well because at least 50%, or more than 50% of the people said, well, we don't want it. We don't think it's necessary. We don't think it will benefit the area. And... You know, we feel perfectly safe here as, as it is. You know, we, 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 don't, we don't think feel we need it. So that was quashed. So that was good going. Frozen. Um, and after that, I uh, became a spokesman for the No CCTV campaign, which is no-cctv.org.uk. And during that whole period, the last few years, really, I've done dozens and dozens of interviews with the mainstream media, uh, television, radio, documentaries, and some of the, some of the alternative media about the issue of uh, CCTV and AMPR cameras, um, the whole surveillance issue, 
but, but focusing on the camera aspect, which is often overlooked now because people just seem to accept that it's just a part of uh, the modern uh, infrastructure. It's part of modern society and, and people don't seem to, 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 to really notice it anymore. So it was really kind of to address that because so few people were, were, were saying anything about it. Um, and um, I, I'm still doing it. I've got an interview tomorrow with ITV News about uh, an AMPR camera system in Royston in Cambridgeshire, uh, which was very controversial. Well, we made it controversial, but otherwise it would have been secret. But I raised it in Parliament and um, we issued a formal complaint to the Information Commissioner. Uh, a ring of steel of AMPR cameras is effectively a series of che border checkpoints which are virtual. So instead of being stopped by the police and, and having your papers checked, it's done automatically and invisibly so people don't tend to notice it. So they care much less about it because it's, it's not intrusive. They don't realise it's even going on. And um, the Information Commissioner, after about two years, ruled that it was in fact unlawful what um, uh, the police were doing in Royston. But the police being the police, they simply carried on. They just said, well, we'll, um, we might take one or two of them down or we might, you know, make some minor alterations and, uh, and just carry on. So um, what's happened recently is that someone's, um, someone's been burgled in Royston and their, their logic is that this wouldn't have happened if we'd have had um, more cameras. So they're saying, um, or, or the police would have caught the burglar if only we'd had more cameras. So this is the sort of logic we're up against. And I, I, I'm often the voice that says, look, there's another side of, the, of an argument and there's much more to it than people realise. And I try and explain what the, uh, the dangers and the threats are. That's great, Steve. No, good job. You know, you've got something done there. Um... Can I just mention one thing before we finish with Steve? Um, you mentioned Royston, and uh, we have actually spoken about this also with Charles as well, uh, Charles Farrier, and um, the issue of bids has come up, the Business Improvement District Scheme. And uh, bids was actually the organisation that has created, asked for the Ring of Steel around Royston. And um, BIDS um, is a system of uh, privatising the police, then privatising security that works internationally, not just in Britain, but also in the United States. And it's not just about CCTV, it's uh, also about things like uh, Wi-Fi, uh, RFID, and general IT connectivity. Uh, but all of this is actually linked to surveillance. So there's a system of um, surveillance, outsourcing CCTV, introducing other forms of uh, surveillance in addition to CCTV that are complementary to CCTV. And um, that, uh, this has all been introduced in a manner that isn't transparent and isn't accountable. Sorry, Nathan, you've sort of jumped in there. Uh, do you want to? Uh, should we then? Do you want to introduce yourself then, so people know who it is that's just spoken? Thanks. Can you hear yeah. me? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. I just ad adjusted the volume on the mic. Anyway, so my name's Nathan Allenby, and um, I've been an activist for over twenty-five years. And I started in a very small way. I got sucked into local environmental issues, really to do with uh, local council planning policy. And uh, there were a number of uh, things. That one was uh, the expansion of a chemical plant. And um, I suppose I stepped into this because nobody else would. And uh, I wasn't somebody who wanted to get involved but I just felt it was wrong that nobody was doing anything. And I've been involved at this at a very local level uh, on issues, similar issues since then, such as uh, road development and uh, planning. And all, all at a very sort of uh, local level, but 
uh, over the years, I've had to learn to do things like work with the press, uh, develop relationships with journalists, learn how to put a case, learn what the whole business of politics is about. And then uh, this went up a gear in about uh, 2006 uh, with uh, the proposals for ID cards or the ID card legislation. And um, I was involved in setting up a, a group against ID cards in my own city, uh, Newcastle. And uh, after I was uh, running that for about, uh, about six months, nearly a, a year, um, I was uh, kicked out of my post as a local coordinator by uh, the national organization. And uh, the reason why they did that was because I'd said that um, ID cards in Britain are linked to Europe. And that was something that the national campaign uh, wouldn't allow to be said. And uh, they said it was wrong. They said it was untrue. And so uh, my response to this was to uh, try and research what this was about. And what I produced was, first of all, a lot of evidence that this wasn't actually even a British scheme. It wasn't a European scheme. This was a, a global scheme. And um, I wrote an article about this. But what I also found was that uh, the European Union was very influential in promoting um, ID cards uh, around the world in developing countries which didn't have the technology and didn't have the resources to implement these schemes. For example, providing um, uh, assistance and uh, technical support in countries like uh, Rwanda and Morocco and goodness knows where else. I wrote quite a long list about it in an article for Global Research. I've also found out that the reason why the European Union was doing this was because of a project to monitor and control migration internationally uh, on a global scale. And let's say, for example, the way uh, the United States uh, controls potential immigrants uh, coming from Mexico. It controls not at the border, but hundreds of miles from the border. And the uh, a new system of ID cards is available to sort of monitor people who move from where they normally live towards the American border, the U.S. border. And there's a similar thing that uh, the European Union's been doing, and it's been monitoring when people leave their homes in Africa and start moving towards the um, Mediterranean or towards the European Union's frontiers, and similarly from Asia. And that they're, they're tracking them with a, a huge variety of different devices, um, including satellites. And that uh, this was one of the reasons why RFID was being put into um, people's ID cards, because it was possible to um, pick up people's ID cards from a distance by various forms of uh, uh, readers. Uh, RFID readers. And so uh, what we found was that there was a, a global system of personal surveillance that was being um, uh, introduced in a systematic way as part of a, a far-reaching plan. And that this had been designed as far back as the um, early 1990s. And certainly uh, the agreement in place had been agreed by the late 1990s. And all of this was you know, publicly available. There had been a great deal of effort to uh, organise this. And um, there were a lot of uh, documents about this. Now, um, I realised that this wasn't just about people's ID cards. It, it, it was linked to a whole load of different ways of tracking and identifying people. 
I realised that the banks were a large part of this and that the system of um, EID, as it's called, electronic identification, was very closely linked to banks and the financial system. And, uh, and then I realised that this was also connected to the privatisation and outsourcing of government services and that um, uh, when government services were being privatised, uh, there was an exchange of personal information that was involved so that uh, companies weren't just buying um, the right to provide services, they were also buying the customer base and they were buying data about the customer base. And of course it's what sort of services are being privatised. It turns out it's not just things like gas, electricity and water. It's also things like the delivery of social services. And there's also a plan to uh, integrate um, health, social care and other services and that these are all to be privatised. So we've talked about schemes that the UK government has been introducing such as um, joined up services, um, whole place and total place which are all schemes whereby um, information will be shared between different organisations, say between local authorities, health authorities, uh, other services, utilities and um, of course since all of these services are going to be privatised, this is going to be, um, and since it's not just going to be privatised, it's going to be international companies that are bidding for local services. So, Of course another part of the thing is to be able to um, have uh, information on people who have migrated, who've come from abroad from maybe the other side of the world and to have a system where their previous customer history or criminal history, the police are involved in this as well, all of that information can be transferred and exchanged. And the ID card is part of a system of creating a personal dossier and a system of being able to transfer all sorts of personal information about everybody. And the idea is, uh, you know, there's going to be more migration and they're very keen on something called circular migration, where uh, a, a, a person comes from one country, say from a developing country, migrates to the, uh, to the West, uh, works and is employed in the West and then goes back home to their own country. Uh, and... Um, the idea is that um, information will be carried from where they've come from back to, you know, to, the, uh, to the West, to the, the country where they're working. And then the information about what they've done while they're in the West, whether or not they've acquired a criminal record, whether or not they've been a good citizen, whatever, what services they've used, how they've used them, how they've behaved, that goes back. And so here we've got the idea that imagine a country like Nigeria uh, well, that will be able to obtain information about its citizens who are living in Britain. we will also be able to obtain information about anybody, frankly. And that the whole idea is that there's a global exchange of personal information about anybody and everybody. And uh, so this is the, uh, the matrix that I've been researching and that I've been involved in. And as I say, the, uh, what was astonishing to me is that the um, well-known NGOs in, uh, in, in Britain and in the West in general don't want to deal with the gender. Uh, it's researched, it's not speculative, it's all available in um, authoritative documents, often government uh, documents, and uh, the government uh, and um, uh, the, uh, the NGOs uh, are trying to brush this aside. So my mission, if you want to call it a mission, is to, um, uh, and I think this is true of all, all, all of the, uh, the, the small campaign groups, is to deal with the issues that the large NGOs uh, don't want to talk about. If, if somebody else was doing this, I wouldn't feel a need to have to do this myself. 
and I'm sure that's true of all of us. The reason why that there's no CCTV, the reason why there's Pippa's campaign, the reason why there are all of these groups and individuals working in the way that we are, is because the uh, the mainstream organisations that get on TV and the radio are not pursuing the issues that ordinary people would be desperately concerned Hence about. That's the reason why the podcast, isn't it? You know, so that we are just ordinary individuals um, that have been through things that are extraordinary. Um, so thank you for that, Nathan. The uh, last but not least is Steve Fernandez, all the way from Texas. Hi, Steve. Do you want to give an introduction and say sort of how you've got from where you were to this point of our first podcast? Oh, absolutely. Um, well, my name is Stephen Hernandez. I'm here in San Antonio, Texas. Um, first, Scott, I guess you would say a worldwide recognition back in 2012 when we were fighting the RFID tracking chips uh, here at Northside Independent School District uh, at John Jay High School and Anson Jones Middle School. But let me uh, just turn back to, you know, a little bit of time. Uh, when I was a boy, uh, my dad talked to me about this when I was a child. Um, I was probably five or six years old. And imagine, if you will, you know, your father talking to you about well, someday they're going to implant a chip in a person and showing you this black and white. I've, I've lost Steve. Let's see if I can get him back. All right. No problem. Uh, so basically, you know, like I said, you know, it started way, way back when I was a boy when my dad would talk to me about it. And that was back before, you know, we had supercomputers. That's back when you had computers that had little punch cards and they would track you by the, the way your punch was on the card and stuff like that. And my dad would talk to me about RFID tracking chips. And he'd say, you know, there's going to be a day where they implant chips into people. And I would, you know, I never thought I'd be the one out of my family or ever be the one to live to be this long and 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 literally had to fight this fight um i remember growing up thinking it was kind of cool if i if we could convent, invent a computer to put in people's brains and and read their thoughts and you know and, and project people's thoughts onto screens growing up i thought that was a cool ideal and then as i got older you know i started looking at things and i just said well you know i, I actually became a sheep and I was like, yeah, as long as it doesn't bother me, I'm all right. But then, as I started to have children, I started looking at the world different. And I started noticing how children were being treated in schools. And so, I've always been known to have a kind of, you know, just say it, I have a big mouth. <laughs> um, I speak what's on my mind when I need to, and I keep my pie hole shut when I don't. Uh, feel that I need to intervene or if I just want to learn a little bit more from somebody else. Uh, so basically, my story starts on August 2012, uh, coming back from Michigan after burying my grandmother who had passed away and visiting with my uncle who was who was dying as well. So on the way back uh, to San Antonio, my wife calls me and she said, you're not going to believe this letter I just got from the school. And I believe it was, it was um, the, uh, while we're on the road, I think the, the date on the letter was August 16th, and um, it said that they were going to do this pilot program where they were going to introduce RFID tracking chips into the school so the kids could learn how to uh, buy their food and get their library books uh, and participate in school with this RFID tracking chip. If you didn't have the chip, that uh, you could not participate in the school programs and you could not participate or even walk onto the school grounds. And uh, as I have her on speakerphone, my, my family, my sister and her kids, my brother-in-law and my kids were in the van. And my daughter said, Dad, this, this, this kind of reminds me of what you were teaching us the other day in the Bible, uh, in the book of Revelations about the mark of the beast. And I said, well, that's exactly what it is. I said, um, they're trying to indoctrinate the children. And if here in the United States, ever since Barack Obama took over, he's really tried to indoctrinate children. The first week he was president, he tried to force a program on television for only school children to watch. But even the local schools were like, they, they, they felt a little 
strange about it. They're, so they sent out letters home and they said, hey, if you want your child to watch this program, yes, you know, mark yes. If no, mark no. And a lot of families opted out because they already knew what he was up to. So in 2012, I went on uh, our local news station and I said, hey, we're not going to do this. Well, to my surprise, somehow, some way, it got out there quick. Joe Pag's radio station here in San Antonio, he was interviewing Katie Delois, who was friend with Catherine Albrecht, and they went on a show and for some reason, nobody could find my information. The news station wouldn't give anybody my info. So I got a call at work, and a buddy of mine says, my goodness, you can turn on radio, man. I said, well, I can't. I'm at work. He says, you are big time. They're talking about you right now on radio. So I get home, and I go to Joe Pack's website, and I click on Katie's name, and it kind of like snowballed from there. Katie was excited to hear from me, and Catherine called me, and then Catherine's partner called me. Everybody's calling me, and... So we started to do a protest in front of Anson Jones, in front of John Jay, and um, surprisingly enough, you know, the kids turned out in droves. I mean, I must talk to 700 to 1,000 kids a day, every single day that I was out there protesting. Um, got petitions signed, uh, we had bus drivers, we had teachers, we had people sneaking over, janitors, maintenance workers, people sneaking over, pretending to go to lunch, sign a petition real quick. And they'd go in to have lunch, and they would tell us, you know, we don't have a choice. They're, they're making us do it. If we don't carry the RFID tracking badge here at school, we'll, we'll lose our jobs. And then we had a teacher come forward and said, look, our badge is fake. We don't have a tracking chip in our badge. Only you guys do. And bling, 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 you know, my, my head is going off, and I'm starting to think about a lot of things right away. And I said, oh, okay, well, what's good for the goose, is, I guess, isn't good for the gander. So it was more, you know do as I say, don't do as I do. So we had a child um, who actually took her badge and she lived probably about 15 miles away. She threw her badge in a bush and came back to school the next day. They called her into the principal's office and said, here's your badge, don't throw it away again. And she said, well, how did you know I threw it away? They said, because we could track your badge. Boom, that was another insight for us because they had said it was only trackable inside the school and only on to the bus. Well, as my daughter got onto the bus to ride home, she asked the bus driver, what is this box that's on the bus? And he says, well, that's for the home program. And she says, what's the home program? And obviously my daughter knew what it was. He says, you know, that's the tracking program. Boom, there was another piece of weaponry I had against them. Because now it wasn't inside the four walls, it was also on the bus. Okay, so now, you know, our fight started to progress very fast. So I was on MSNBC, CBS, ABC, NBC, Fox News. Um, I did all kinds of Internet interviews, uh, radio interviews, Alex Jones. Um, I was on a lot of talk shows. So we went to the Capitol building to fight it. And um, Representative Kokers at that time, she had been fighting, I think, for, uh, since two. 2005, I can I believe, or 2001, somewhere around there. And I personally did not know about that because I had just moved back to San Antonio. I had moved in and out of San Antonio for about 15 years. And um, one of the things that disturbed me about Northside Independent School District is that for my children to go to the schools in our district, one of the representatives told me, hey, well, do, do your children speak Spanish? And I was like, no, why? And they were like, well, because they have to wait behind those who speak Spanish. And that's when the lights went on. I was like, wait a minute. You're putting American citizens behind illegal immigrants' children. So I started to figure out there was a problem with the school district. They're the most powerful school district in San Antonio. And each board member sits on probably between six to eight different boards throughout the city. We're talking uh, CPS, which is our electric company, uh, SAWS, which is our San Antonio water company. Uh, they sit on Clear Channel Communications, which is the TV and radio stations. They sit on um, uh, the tourism board here in San Antonio, the Chamber of Commerce. So I'm thinking to myself, why do every one of these board members sit on a different board throughout the city? Quite simple. Northside Independent School District 
runs the city of San Antonio. So they control the tourism that comes in and out. They get a dollar for every person that comes in and out of this city. They get money somewhere, somehow. Okay, they control this city. They control our water, our electricity. They control the councilmen. They control everybody here. And to, I started to, to learn more and more. And then as I started to learn more and more, the more and more I started to learn about politics and how politics was played. Um, I've always been the kind of guy who's always stuck up for the little person. And if I see something wrong, you know, I try to write that wrong. But my, I was always wondering why growing up my dad would say, hey, son, you can't write every wrong. There's just some things you got to walk away from. But at that time, I never realized I was trying to be that person to write every wrong. I just was so used to being in arguments with people all the time because I wouldn't put up with stuff. Now I see it actually helps me. So when I got involved with this fight with Northside, you know, we went to the Capitol building here in Austin and we fought it. Uh, Representative Coker's at that time had been fighting it for a while. And she brought in about 14 of us and we uh, testified in front of the committee. And the committee was you know, very truthful. They were like, every time you come up in front of our committee, you know, you wind up walking away the loser. Basically, is what he told in front of, you know, a room full of people. He goes, but I've never seen you come in with this many witnesses. So we had uh, Mike Wade from Wade Garcia, the ones who uh, sold the chips to Northside there, and another RFID company there. And um, they just got annihilated on a stand by the committee. The committee just destroyed them. And so we went home thinking that, you know, we're going to win this. And so probably about a week later, Heather Fazio calls me back up and says, hey, I need you to come back up to Capitol building because we're going to start petitioning all these senators and congressmen. So we did. Uh, we were told flat out by Letitia uh, Vanderpilt, um, which is a Democratic senator. She has now stepped down to run for mayor in San Antonio. We were told by her office straight up, you're going to lose. She said, They're, these companies are bigger than you. They're going to throw money at this, at this particular senator. They'll pull it out at the end. You're going to lose no matter what. And to have them be that blatant and let's just call it honesty about their lies and their, and their, their dirty ways, it was just amazing to us. Everybody's mouth fell open. We couldn't believe it. So underneath our fight, my fight was a religious fight. It was for my salvation and for my daughter's salvation, the salvation of those Christians around me who, who disagreed with it but were too scared to stand up. Um, I guess you could say I've never been the kind of guy to back down from anybody, any fear of anything or any repercussions. I've always taken the responsibility for my actions. So suffice to say, you know, Northside didn't like me. I didn't like them. We won in state court. Uh, the, the state judge was like, you know, he, he told my – he told – Northside's lawyers, he says, are you really that afraid of this little girl that you have to kick her out of school because she won't wear your RFID tracking chip? Does she threaten you that much? They, and they were like, no, sir. He goes, well, fine. Then she gets to stay in school. Well, they said, fine. Okay, she stays in school. Well, Northside wanted to take it to federal court. And I knew immediately the reason Northside wanted to take it to federal court that fast is because they had a judge in her pocket, which they did. Judge Orlando Garcia he is a liberal judge, and he's been chastised many times by the United States Supreme Court for not following the rules. Um, he doesn't follow the rules of the Constitution. He doesn't do anything correctly. He just does and says what he wants. Well, it comes to turn out after some um, research by Al Gerloff, one of the other parents was fighting with us, that Judge Orlando Garcia was a um, attorney for Northside many, many, many years ago when he was just starting up. He was an up-and-comer. He was a collection attorney uh, where he would go around and collect money and fundraisers uh, for Northside. Um, so we're wondering why during court they only asked us seven questions while my attorney grilled them and grilled me and grilled my daughter. But they only asked seven questions to me. And so we walked out feeling confident that we had won. Well, why should I feel confident if I knew this liberal judge was going to rule for them anyways? And so sure enough, uh, they ruled against us, uh, so they threw my daughter out of school, and she had to go to another school. Well, the fight didn't really end there. Even though I was told to be quiet, I couldn't do any interviews. I lost all my contacts in in the uh, media. People who wanted to talk to me because my attorneys wouldn't let me talk to anybody. And to this day, even though I have all these people's contact number information, I can't get anybody to come out to interview me. 
They'll send a cameraman to ask me questions. And they'll run a 30-second piece about me on television. And so my attorneys actually hurt me worse than what Northside did. So all the time that I was quiet, sitting down for those nine months, I get a phone call from the same friend who called me to tell me, hey, you're all over the radio. He says, you're all over TV right now. You need to turn on the television. And so I run to the game room and I turn on the, the, the television and I'll be Northside gave it gave it all up. They said we didn't make enough money. I, I can't I can't hear you, Catherine. Uh, no, I'm so sorry. I, I need to go because my little one's crying and I have to go and see him. I'm so sorry. It was great to uh, speak to you and you know I'll I'll get connected later on. Okay. Uh, Cheers, guys. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah, have a good night. So I'll so I'll cut this down real for, quick for you. <laughs> so. Um, the reason we got involved with that is because it was a religious conviction for us. And as we turned on the television, it was because Northside had, had just said, you know what, we didn't make enough money. It was a $536,000 program for two schools, and it was $136,000 to run those that program for two schools. So you're looking at you know three quarters of a million dollars just to run this program for two schools. So... You know, we, we took it as a victory. Northside took it as, ah, they, they can call it a victory all they want, but it's just we didn't make money. Well, the reason they didn't make any money is because my daughter inspired 6,700 children not to wear an RFID tracking chip. So long story short, that's how I got involved. I got involved uh, because it was a religious aspect for me. And I truly believe that everything that the Bible says is exactly what they're trying to do in this nation. Uh, Steve made some valid points. Nathan... If, uh, Catherine, every one of your stories as you told them, I felt like I was there with you. I could see it in my head. And every one of us seems to have the same ideal. We know what's about to happen. We know what's coming. But it's our job to spread the word and to make people aware of this. Because some people are just like, nah, if it doesn't bother me, it doesn't matter. But my, my job is to continue to fight because I believe that Northside it's just waiting for Andrea to graduate and then waiting for my son to graduate. They're just biding their time. And then after Vincent graduates in two years, they're going to reintroduce it. They might even try it before that. But they don't understand that I'll still be here and I'm still going to fight this. I'd just like to back one thing you said there. You said your attorneys hurt you worse than anybody else. And it's amazing how many people I've heard say the same thing. Your lawyers aren't working for you, that they're, they're, they're working for somebody else. And in Britain, that's actually officially the system that uh, 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 lawyers, solicitors or barristers, they're, they're actually officers of the court. So they work for the court, even though you pay. You might pay them, but they don't work for you. <laughs> they work for the court. And I actually, I actually learned that during this, this process. Uh, Al had sent me a history of attorneys. That doesn't matter who the attorney is defending. They're actually officers of the court. So they're actually working for the government, not you. So yeah. it's all it's all a big ruse. Uh, but, you know, I'm still here, and I'm so happy to be with every one of you on this fight, on this podcast, and on this journey, because I believe that we can spread the word and get it out to more and more people and start getting more and more people involved. It really just takes one person to do it, and each one of us, was that one person and in our individual stories that started to turn things around. And that's what we need to continue to do. Now we can take our collective minds and start turning the world around. There's a reason why we were all here together. Mm. I apologize if I chit chat too much, but once I get going on an ideal, I can't stop. Collective. Pippa's always smiling, and, and Nathan, I can tell you're always thinking. So me, once I get that thought, my pie hole doesn't shut. It just keeps running. But that's how I got involved because my dad planted that seed 40 years ago when I was a child. And I'm his second son, and I'm the one that's leading the fight. And I'm proud to say that I am proud to be my dad's son, and I'm proud to be the man that he wanted me to be. And I'm proud to be uh, a member of this group right here. And I love each and every one of y'all because you guys are fighters. 
uh, and uh, you guys are doing the right thing at all times. So I just want to say, you know, God bless you all, and um, I look forward to working with every one of you, and uh, let's get things started.